Hey everyone, this is Josh here for Deuces Cracked with the second edition of Applied Math. Uh, for this episode, we're going to continue along with what we started last week. Um, pick up the pace a little bit, but not too much. Uh, start talking about, um, instead of just calculating EV, you know, sort of for the sake of calculating EV, we're going to start looking at developing ranges, developing strategies based our, on our opponent's tendencies. And I'm also going to talk about adjustments, how our opponent may adjust to you know this range based on that, because opponents' ranges are not static. Um, you know when they see you bluff with you know with say in this case a deuce or see you bluff with a not low, it's likely that they're going to adjust their range by um, you know bluff catching a little bit more. So we'll talk about how our opponent may adjust, how we may adjust, you know the balancing exploitable strategies, um, because I think a lot of people throw away throw around those terms without really understanding exactly what they mean um, and this this will give us really a, a a good example I think of what it means to be exploitable how our opponents can exploit that when you when you want to stay exploitable um, and the types of uh, adjustments you can make if your opponent is is good then we're going to move on to a, a slightly more realistic example where our opponent starts betting with uh, his strong hands instead of checking any card um, and you know, starts calling with a wider range. And we will finish off with the out of position situation, um, basically just putting ourselves in our opponent's position and, and developing a strategy based on that. And I think putting all of these together, all of these will be just the 13 card deck uh, scenarios. I think putting all these together, we'll get a really good idea of developing strategies, uh, what it means to be you know polarized or merged, what it means to be um, you know the types of the magnitude of mistakes that we make um, and then just you know just generally developing a strategy and I think this will give us a really strong foundation for going further into actual uh, poker like hold them hands instead of just this you know, made up game but um, this is sort of the best thing I could think of as far as um, just understanding one street play understanding river play understanding developing strategies uh, so we'll start off by continuing uh, with this table so the quiz answer uh, hopefully you took the time to uh, you know fill it out is you should be bluffing the three and uh, it's neutral or we're indifferent between betting or checking the four so very quickly I'll finish out this table and uh, I'll show you some tricks to to finishing it out because um, if you were to sit here and, and test out every excuse me every scenario then it would take forever to fill up the tables um, so we'll start with a three when we have a three I'm not going to keep changing this, but we have a three, we get seven folds. Uh, we're never value betting, but we get called by better hand five times. So now the interesting thing about betting with the deuce through a nine is it's, a f it's effectively the same thing. We're going to make, when we get called, we're only getting called by these Broadway cards. And when we fold, we're folding the other seven cards that you know we don't have. So this is all going to be the same seven, zero, five. And we can just copy and drag that right down. Now we get to the 10. The ten's a little bit better because we get eight folds. We get the deuce through the nine all to fold. And I, I count on my, hand, on my fingers when it comes to this. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So don't be ashamed to do that. Um... And then we can move on to the jack. We're still getting eight folds. Now this time we get value from the ten. We're getting called by the queen, king, and ace and lose. Um, and now another thing you'll you'll notice is this is linear. And if we sort of play around with it and see how these work, basically this last one here just doesn't matter. The EV is zero when we lose, so or the you know the final stack EV is zero, so it just has no effect on on the the overall answer. All it has an effect are the fold and the 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 value bet situations. So from 10 through ace, we're going from 0 with the 10 to 1 with the jack to 2 with the queen because the 10 of the jack calls. So it's linear. We're going up incrementally and what we can do is plug in a little formula which would just be this times 2. The one above it times 2 minus the one before it. Um, which works. Uh, if, if you don't understand how it works, you can um, you know, just do the long way, which would just be uh, finding the difference, then adding it to this one. But it, it works. 
And the, the beauty of Excel Open Office is you can just drag it right down. So just to double check that this works, 1333 does work. Now um, with this one, the EV of checking, we'll start with a three. We win once if he has a deuce, we lose the other times. And once again, this is linear. So we can plug in our same formula. The one above it times two minus the one. Oops. And we can double check that these work. This should be 583, and it is. This should be 833, and it is. And the ace, we win every time. $10, so it works out. Um, so what um, what I've decided to do is this is this is a really good spot to uh, to put it in if statement uh, it just makes life a little bit easier instead of having to type in bet 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 or bet bet neutral check check uh, it will do it for you so but instead of doing that right now um, something I thought of when I was creating the series is maybe at the end of each video I'll have like a little Excel tip so today's Excel tip at the end of the video will be uh, the if statement the embedded if statement uh, and yeah so you know, if, if that's if you want to learn a little bit more about Excel and OpenOffice and you don't know about that, just you can watch uh, the the very end of the video and I'll explain it. So um, we'll just you know type them in bet bet neutral check. Ugh. Why is it doing that to me? And I'll just copy and paste it down. Um, now I also like to have a little, just to get an idea, EV of the best line. And we'll do the max. This just gives, spits out the maximum of a number of different um, cells. So it'll give the maximum between betting and checking, which will be the EV of our best line. So as expected, you know, the EV goes up as our hand value gets greater. Um, something that I will show you how to do in this series is, is graph. I don't think it's particularly important for this example, so I'm not going to waste everyone's time with that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're, we're going to color code this and, and take a look at what this range looks like. But before we do that, I want to show you something that's I think is pretty interesting. So how much EV are we losing by making the wrong decision? So we're going to get the absolute value. I mean, you could you could simply subtract the best line from the worst line. Uh, but I think the absolute value just shows you the difference between these two numbers, the absolute value of the difference. And I'll highlight the biggest numbers, everything over 2. And I thought this was really interesting. In this example, the worst thing you can do is bet a, bet a 9. Betting a 9 is worse than checking the nuts. And if you had asked me before we did this, you know, what's the worst thing you can do in this given example, I would say you know, checking the nuts is obviously the worst thing you can do, but it's not the case. The worst thing you can do is bet the hand where all better hands fold, all worse hands call. Uh, <laughs> all better hands call, all worse hands fold. Um, which you know, makes sense thinking about it, but I think that's... Uh, it goes to show why bad players are so bad and no limit, why they just get killed is because they make huge mistakes that are even worse than certain common sense mistakes. And um, that just goes to show you, you know, thinking about it on the flop, um, a lot of times we're like, ah, whatever, it's just a flop bet, it's just a continuation bet, I'll just put in that bet where all the better hands will call and all the worse hands fold. It, 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 EV-wise, it's, it's a catastrophe. So um, even, you know, betting the 8 or the 10 are equivalent to checking the nuts. And also betting the seven is a, is a pretty big mistake, and even um, betting a, the uh, betting the six is as bad as checking the king. So it's, I think it's pretty interesting, but we'll delete that. I just wanted to show that point. So it just I mean we, I just learned so much from just running these these simple tables that I mean seem to have no real relevance, but it just shows you kind of how poker works, how the one street river scenario works. Uh, and then it, it, and you learn things like how bad it is to bet that hand where all better hands call and all worse hands fold. So 
we'll ha we'll do green for the bet because it's like a a green light, red for a check. It's like a red light, and we'll do a little yellow light for neutral. So lean back in your chair and and take a look at that range. That is a polarized range, and I mean that's the you know the quintessential nuts or air. We're either betting the ace, the king, the deuce, or the three, with the you know the four and the queen being neutral. Um, so I clearly think about it. This is pretty easy to play against. If our opponent has, let's say our opponent has the five, and we're betting, even if we don't bluff the four, we bet the ace, the king, the queen, the two, or the three. He wins forty percent of the time. He wins if we have the two or the three. He loses if we have the ace, the king, or the queen. So he wins on two out of five cards if he calls. And uh, that's 40%. Sorry. Uh, I don't know why it's doing that. That's okay. Uh, so he wins 40% of the time. He's getting two to one because we've bet pot. Everyone knows, hopefully, that you know when you're getting two to one, you need to win 33% of the time. So he's winning more than the requisite amount. He can call. If he decides he wants to adjust, he can start calling with the five or or higher, he can actually start. I think he can call. You can call it the four too, because still it'll be forty percent. So he can call with anything except for the two or the three profitably. So if he really wants to adjust, he can by just calling everything. And if we don't pick up on that, then we're just going to get bloodbathed because our, we're you know, I got maybe I wouldn't say bloodbath because we're only betting bluffing two cards, but. The overall EV of our, our line will go down. So the overall EV of this is, is five dollars and fifty-eight cents. That's the average EV, you know, given that we don't given a random card. If he starts calling with let's say um, we'll find the EV of the two, the three, the ace, or the king. Um Given that he's going to start calling with the four through ace, so now we have a two. I'm curious how the EV will change. So when we have the two, he folds the three and he calls with everything else. Um, we never win when he calls, and he calls with a better hand: four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, ace, eleven cards. So when we bet the deuce and he starts calling, he, he makes you know the correct adjustment. We're losing 833. When we've got the three, it's the same situation. He's going to fold the deuce and he's going to call with everything else and win. Now obviously, this is where the you know so-called Shania value comes in, meaning that since we've convinced him that we're you know we're bluffing too much and he's going to start bluff catching everything the value of having the nuts just goes way up so if you're you know if you play uh 50 preflop raises when you do pick up aces you're going to get a lot of value so uh when we have the king he's still now he's folding two cards um he's going to call with the ace and we're going to lose and he'll call with the 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 Jack and Queen. So he's going to call with nine cards. So this is our EV. And with the Ace, now he'll, he's going to call with ten worst cards, and we're never going to lose. And everything else is going to stay the same because, um, well, actually, we're betting the Queen, so the Queen will. Uh, This is for the queen because we lose if he's got an ace or a king, else we win. So the EV of betting a queen does go up. Unless we don't make the adjustment yet that we should be start value betting the jack. We'll work on that in a, in a moment. Everything else stays the same. The reason we don't change the four is because we're still checking it. So let's find out the the EV of this line, this uh, the result of our opponent's adjustment. So our EV goes down. He's cost us... So we don't exactly get bloodbathed. Actually, it should be. So yeah, so we don't exactly get you know destroyed, but it's still costing us you know a good whatever it is four percent of our EV um, when he makes that adjustment. So 
this goes to show that there are three possible adjustments we can make. And I'll, I'll go into um, a PowerPoint uh, because that'll be a little bit cleaner. And I'll be right back in PowerPoint. So here is our PowerPoint. Um, so as I said, you know, our original range is 40% bluff, 60% value. Assuming that we're not bluffing the four, we are value betting the queen just to have a little more balanced range. But if we're still playing sort of this optimal strategy based on our opponent or this opponent strategy that we know, then we're playing inherently exploitable. So our opponent can bluff catch the four up through ace. So we're losing 7% of our EV. And we have three options. Uh, you know, relative to this, given that, given this knowledge that we are playing exploitably, we have three options. Option one is to just simply not adjust. Uh, our opponent, ha we think our opponent has a static range. No matter what we do, even if he keeps catching us bluffing the two and the three, he's going to keep calling only Broadway cards. And I mean, this this can definitely be the case sometimes. I mean, against certain fish, they they just don't know how to adjust. They're still going to call. They're good hands. They don't know what bluff catching means and so on. Against mass tablers, maybe they don't notice. Maybe they don't have time to adjust. They're playing too many tables to uh, to make these types of considerations. Or just generally unobservant opponents. Um, someone you may notice that uh, doesn't uh, adjust his strategy. And this is why, um, or where you could even say people who don't know how to adjust. Um, which could be um, just you know generally um, not very good players. So I mean, this is why you know sometimes you see people saying you know it's okay to play exploitably because it is. If you're playing against the right type of opponent, it is um, you know it is good. But the problem is if this person is adjusting and you don't you don't realize it, you know we can go back to this. We're, we're costing ourselves like seven percent of our EV, and you know with win rates getting smaller and smaller over time of even the biggest winners, um, you know, th that type of hit is is pretty critical. So option number two is play the adjustment game. And this is, um, I think this is pretty interesting because I never really understood up until this point, I never really understood um, what it meant to, you know, or like what it really meant to level. Like I, you know, kind of knew, but never saw it in, in an example. So our opponent starts bluff catching. So right, if if we're really really good at psychology, uh, you know some of the the huge nosebleed winners, that's like that's their bread and butter is is the psychology, and this is sort of illustrates exactly what that edge in psychology is. They know when they they ha they just have this sense of when their opponent is going to start bluff catching. As a result, we start value betting. As soon as our opponent catches on, and now only calls with strong hands, we start bluffing again. So if you can stay one step ahead of your opponent, then you can pretty much uh, derive some EV just out of thin air. And um, you know this is this is leveling. Staying one step ahead of your opponent, he thinks that I'm um, bluffing a lot, so as a result, I'm not going to bluff. He thinks I'm never bluffing, so as a result, I'm going to start bluffing a lot. So I'm going to fill out this table and we're going to play this kind of cat and mouse game. And I'm going to show how the EV of our best line will keep going up. And then we'll go into our third option, which is also pretty interesting. Um, so now we, we've determined that our opponent is uh, calling with, make a new table. Now he's calling, calling four through ace. 4 through ace, which is 11 cards. Folds, 2, 3, 2 cards. Okay, so I did a little um, cleaning up for, of this. Basically, I moved the table down. Um, here's our new EV table. He's calling with 11 cards. He's folding two of them. Uh, I got rid of the, the check table because the EV of checking is going to be the same um, because he's not changing his betting strategy right now. He's only ch changing his calling strategy. So um, the EV of now bluffing a deuce is he's folding just one card. He's folding the three, and he calls. He never calls with um, better. He only calls. He never calls with worse. He only calls with better. So the EV of bluffing a deuce clearly we shouldn't be bluffing very often, and bluffing the not low is not going to work out for us. Um, moving on with the three, it's the same exact thing.
Um, now with the four, he's going to fold the two or the three, and he's going to he's going to call with everything bigger. Um, now with uh, with the rest of the cards, he's still going to fold two, but now we start getting a little bit of value. So we've, if we've got the five, he's going to call with the four. So now it becomes linear once again, as you can see, incrementally. Um, so we can fill out the table that way. Our same formula, this times two minus, oops, minus the one before it. And just to double check to make sure it works, we'll check the A's. So when we have the A's, he's folding the two and the three. We're winning every card, and we're never losing. I mean, we're, we're winning when he calls with his other 10. So our EV 1833, that works out. Now EV of best line. Um, we'll do best. EV of best is going to be the max between our bet and our check, which we already knew. We can drag that down. And uh, our best play here is to check, 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 neutral, bet, 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 bet. So, I mean, this, I think this makes sense. Do our bet green. When our opponent starts bluff catching a lot, clearly we just want to start value betting and not bluffing. So that's exactly what we did. We're getting more value from our bets because he's calling with the four up through the. Wait, sorry, he's betting with he's calling with the four up through the ace. As a result, we can get away with bluff uh, value betting more. We can't ever bluff profitably, or it's not the best play ever. So now the interesting thing, and this is where I was saying we can basically derive EV out of thin air. Because now we've stayed one step ahead of our opponent. We, we realize that he's adjusting by bluff catching a lot. As a result, as soon as he adjusts, we adjust. Now we've just made like $1.40, $1.35, and that is 24% more. We've just derived 24% more EV just by staying one step ahead. And I think this just really illustrates and before you know before I started running these numbers like I just never I never quite understood the magnitude of this advantage of 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 having that psychological advantage of understanding how your opponent how he's adjusting. Um, and that's I mean I think that just goes to show why psychology is so important in poker. I mean granted you're never going to you're never going to know like the exact point when your opponent adjusts, but even if you can even if you can pick up a small fraction of this it's still it's still great so we'll take it one step further now our opponent comes up with a uh, a strategy based on this and he's only going to call let's say we we decide that we're going to bet the um we're going to bet the nine we're going to bet the nine ten jack queen king ace so his response should be that when he's got the, he's only going to call it now with strong hands, clearly, because we're value betting strong hands. So his adjustment, if we go back to the PowerPoint, is he stops bluff catching. And we need to start bluffing again. So when he's got, let's say he's got the 10. Now, four hands are better, one hand's worse, so he's winning 20% of the time. Now, when he's got the jack, he's winning... Uh, two out of five, he's winning forty percent. So that's enough. So he's going to call with a jack up through the ace. So our adjustment in turn is to make the best strategy, given that he's only calling with the jack up through the ace, and it's going to look similar to this. But we'll do it one more time. So the EV of betting the deuce, given that he's only calling with four cards, is that he's going to fold the other eight. We never win. He calls with four.
And I do believe that this game never ends. I don't think that there's that equilibrium point where everyone's happy. I could be wrong with that. I haven't ran it, run it enough times. I've run it a couple more, but I, I don't think I think it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, but it would be interesting. Maybe after this video, I'll, I'll test that out um, to see if there is that equilibrium where um, we've adjusted to the point where we can't adjust anymore. But I don't think that's the case. I think we keep bouncing back and forth. Um, okay, so that's with the um, that's with the deuce with the three, same thing up through the ten. Because we're still getting with all of these all of these cards, we're still getting the, the eight folds, the other eight cards, and we're still getting called four times by better hands. So we can simply copy and paste that. Now for the jack, now we get nine folds. And we lose, we, we never get value. Um, with the uh, queen, we get value from the jack. We lose twice, though. We should know that that's suboptimal because we're getting called um, by worse, by better hands more often than not. And now we can extrapolate once again. And double check on the ace. The ace would be uh, zero and three. I mean three and zero. Twelve fifty works out. So best. Line EV of best. Once again, we'll take our, we're going to take our max between our bet, oops, semicolon, and check. And here we're going to um, oh, bet, 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 bet. Uh, where is this neutral? This is neutral. Check, check. Check, 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 bet, bet. So now once again we'll color code and we'll, you know, we'll conclude this particular strategy after that. So once again, we're back to being, instead of now only betting the nuts, now we're back to actually being, um, somewhat balanced here because if we're offering two to one and one third of our range is um, one third of our range is value then we're actually pretty balanced but let's find our EV is now f only 590 however it still is greater than you know, our quote unquote optimal strategy to start by a factor of 6% oops yeah 6% Uh, so you know that'll conclude what this you know cat and mouse adjust readjust game looks like, uh, and that leaves us to option number three. We've discussed option number one, which is playing against the static range, play optimally, don't worry about him adjusting because he won't. Option number two, play the adjustment game because we are we're better at psychology, we're better at at adjusting quicker and more efficiently than our opponent. And option number three, let's say you find yourself at a table uh, with Kranz, who is you know a master of psychology and uh, as a result, you just you know if you play this this adjusting game, he's going to raise his EV, and we're going to you know subsequently lose our EV. So we don't want to do that. There's a third option we can take, and that is play unexploitably. And, and you know this is something that people throw around all the time. You know you should play unexploitably, and this just goes to show there are other options, and usually you should take those other options as opposed to doing this. This is only if you're against a really tough opponent. Uh, or if maybe you move up in stakes, you take a shot with um, like two two limits higher than you normally play, and there's a big fish, but you're against really tough opponents. Maybe you now want to play unexploitably. But even if that's the case, I mean you're you're so rarely playing with these opponents. I, anyway, um, what it unexploitably means is make your opponent indifferent with the middle of his range. If he's got say a seven, we want him to have the same EV between folding and calling. In other words, zero EV. If he folds at zero EV, if he calls at zero EV, in order to accomplish that, since he's getting two to one, and he needs to win 33% of the time, we're going to let him win 33% of the time. We're going to make it such that he wins 33% of the time. In other words, we're bluffing 33% of the time. One out of three hands, 
we're bluffing. Two out of three hands, we're value betting. So we'll see what that sort of looks like. We're going to go back to our first strategy, which was inherently unbalanced. So we have three value, the ace, the king, the queen, two bluffs. Um, hopefully it makes sense why we're evaluating the queen and not bluffing the four. It's because uh, we're unbalanced already. So we want to you know, get a little bit closer to being balanced by having more value than bluffs. So we have 40% bluffs. Now what we want is to have 33% bluffs. There's two ways we can accomplish this. We can either go three value, 1.5 bluffs, and what does that mean? That means that uh, half the time we have a three, we should bluff with it. Why is that? Because you know it, there's no way of doing a, like a half a hand, so it's, we have to kind of create that half a hand by betting the three fifty percent of the time and checking the three fifty percent of the time. So effectively, we have one and a half quote unquote combinations of bluffs. Now, how would you do this at the table? Uh, if you've read Theory of Poker by Sklansky, his idea is go by the second hand on the clock. So if there's a clock on the wall and you're playing in a tournament or something, then if the second hand is between 0 and 30, or between 1 and 30, then you should bluff. If it's between 31 and 0, you should not bluff. Kind of silly. Um, another example would be Let's say um, you determine that on a given day, you know, the black cards will be your bluffing cards, the red cards will be your non-bluffing cards. So if you want to bluff half the time, if you've got the three of spades, then or the three of clubs, you would bluff. If you had the three of hearts or three of diamonds, that you would not bluff. But anyway, um, that's option number one. Option number two is keep our bluffs, but now we'll go four value. What does four value mean? I mean, either way, we're going suboptimal because when we're checking the three sometimes, half the time, we are, you know, foregoing the, you know, the higher EV option to be unbalanced. I mean, to be balanced. And here we're going to start betting the jack to be balanced because even though it's technically against this range of 10 through ace, it's not correct to be betting the jack uh, in order to be unexploitable. We would. So our EV of. Um, of the first, which is the, th the three value and one and a half bluffs, would be everything is the same except for the three. When we have the three, 50% of the time, we're taking our bet EV, which is optimal in a, in a vacuum, and 50% of the time, we're taking our check EV. So instead of making our full EV, we're costing ourselves a few cents. And now the EV of our the EV of our entire line is 554. We're losing four cents um, in terms of percent, costing ourselves like 0.6 percent. And the EV of the second, also very simple. The only thing that we're changing is now we're betting the jack. So we're taking the suboptimal line. Uh, yeah, we're betting the jack. So now 545. So in this case, we are better off. Uh, we are better off bluffing less than making bad value bets, and and that does make sense because um, it's actually significantly worse. Um, it does make sense because as uh, as we discussed earlier, some of the worst things that you can do are make those bad bets where you know only better hands call for the most part and worse hands all fold. So with the jack, that's the case. Betting with the jack is pretty bad because you're only getting called by you're only getting value one time out of four, and the other three times out of four you're getting called by a better hand. And you know when you're making hands fold, or you could have checked and the EV would have been the same anyway. So uh, we're we're better off we're better off bluffing less than value betting too thin or like value cutting ourselves so um, that just goes to show this would be our our unexploitable our best unexploitable line here would be bet the deuce the queen the king and the ace always 
And 50% of the time, depending on the second hand on the clock, bet your three. That'll wrap up um, this example. And, you know, I went a bit further into it than, you know, I intended when we recorded last week. Um, but I just, I learned a lot about, about ranges, about constructing ranges, about when you do and don't want to balance, about what this balance strategy looks like, and about this, you know, this cat and mouse uh, adjusting and readjusting game and how it can really add EV if you're, if you're good at it. So, um yeah, I think that that you know the next time you see a, a post or a video where the person talks about playing unexploitably, you can have a better understanding of that because I know I will. Uh, this will lead into our quiz question of the day, and uh, this is sort of um, a bridge between this past example and our next example. And I was actually going to uh, do this in uh, the video, but we're really I'm um, you know going over time uh, longer than I thought I would so I figured the best way to incorporate this would be in the form of a quiz if you're feeling motivated you can go ahead and do this otherwise I'll show the answers next week if you have any questions feel free to post in the in the video thread uh, and ask and that also reminds me that would love some more input and in, in terms of what you'd like to see in this series uh, but anyway uh, with this quiz same as before we are uh, in position, same 13 card deck, $10 pot, $10 stacks. Um, but this time, instead of checking every card, our opponent starts betting. He's going to bet a deuce as a bluff, and he'll value bet the king or the ace. And I want to know, after he checks this three through range of three through queen, what is what, what card should he call with in order to minimize hero's total EV? So... Basically, come up with his uh, strategy, our strategy based on that, our EV of our strategy based on that, and figure out uh, the you know the way that he can play that minimizes our EV. Now, just to start you off, so you don't do every single like every single possible combination, uh, it's going to be somewhere around you know calling half of his range. So. Try things like in the middle there, see what our EV based on, say, his range of calling 9 through queen, 8 through queen, uh, and folding the rest, and see how our, our EV, the player in position, changes with our, with our betting range, ignoring, you know, the deuce, king, and ace. So um, that'll be our quiz question for the day, and I'll uh, show my answer for that at the beginning of next week's video. And it, it will help tie in uh, this next example, because we're seeing how things work from both perspectives. So now we continue with our uh, developing optimal strategies uh, with this situation being out of position we have a completely different scenario uh, so what I've done is instead of you watching me create tables and all of that uh, I've uploaded a link to this spreadsheet right now it's you know clean and we'll start filling in the numbers um, so it's tinyurl, tinyurl.com slash am2oop like apply math to out of position that helps you remember it. So in this situation, we've got forty dollars stacks. We've got ten dollars in the pot. All bets will be ten dollars, whether you know we bet or we check on our opponent bets. And raises will be to forty. So all bets are pot. Pot size bet, pot size raises makes things a little bit easier, a little bit cleaner. So we estimate that our opponent's strategy is that if we bet, he's going to raise with an ace, a king, or a deuce. So notice that uh, that is balanced in that. It is one third bluffs, two thirds value. So, uh, you know, if that's the case, he's offering us two to one when he raises, sixty to win twenty, uh, sixty to win thirty, and uh, we win one third of the time. So it's break even for us. Uh, villain will call with the queen, a jack, or a ten if we bet, and he'll fold to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And notice that his overall range is also pretty balanced in that uh, when we bet. Say we bet a random card, then on average, you know, six times he's not folding, seven times he is folding. So that puts us close to indifferent in that we're we're risking ten to win ten, so uh, fifty percent breaks even for us. So it's it's very close. When we check, he's going to bluff the two and the three. He's going to value bet the jack through the ace. Once again, this is balanced. Uh, he'll have one third bluffs, two thirds value. When we check, he'll check it back and get to showdown with the 4 through a 10. And we have the option of check raising. 
So if we check, he bets 10, we push for 40, and he'll call with an ace or a king out of this uh, 2-3, jack, queen, king, ace. And also notice that that is, um, uh, notice that is um, balanced in that he's calling with one-third of his range. We would be laying 40 to win 20, so we would need him to fold two-thirds of the time, and he would, 2-3, jack, queen, king, ace. So we're going to have a lot of, you know, indifferent type uh, situations. Like a lot of things will be equal. So now we fill in our table. Uh, when we bet and he folds, we get our 40 starting stack plus the $10 in the pot. When he calls and we win, we're going to get his 10 plus the 10 in the pot. 60. When we get called and lose, we're down to 30. Uh, when he raises and we fold, doesn't matter whether or not he's bluffing or not. We're going to end up with 30 because we're folding. Now this is the bet call table. The first few are going to be the same. And that's all the same. So if he's bluffing and we call, we get all the money. We get our we have our initial 40, we get his 40, and we get the 10 in the pot. So we get all $90 in play. Otherwise, we're broke. And now moving on to the check table. If we check and we're folding, it doesn't matter whether or not he's bluffing or not. We're still going to have 40. If he checks it back and we win, we get the $10 in the pot. If he checks it back and we lose, we're back to where we started. Now the check call table. If we check, he bluffs, we call and win. We get our 40 plus the 10 in the pot plus the 10 that he bet is 60. If we call and lose, we're f our starting 40 less 10. Uh, when he checks down, we win. Again, 50. We check checks down, we lose. Still 40. Now this is the check raise table. Um, so it it will go. Ch we check. He bets. We raise. So we check. We still have 40. He bets 10. We shove. He folds. So we get his $10 bet, and we get the $10 in the pot for 60. Now when we bet and he call, we check raise all in. He calls. We end up. We get all the money. We get the 90. And when we were broke, when he, we check raise and he calls and we lose, and then this is the same as above. When we when he checks down, we win. We get the extra 10. So now we just need to figure out, um, you know, the the breakdown of the cards. So we'll first we'll do all, just the betting ones, and then we'll move on to the calling ones. So we have a deuce. He's gonna fold three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He's gonna fold seven cards. He's gonna call, and we, we're never gonna get value. But when he calls, we're gonna lose three cards. Um, he's gonna raise the ace, the king, and the deuce. But we have the deuce. We have a blocker to his uh, bluff. To we have a blocker to his bluff. So. When he raises, it's only going to be with a better hand. And now this bottom one is just a counter, just to make sure that we got 12. Indeed, we do. So we'll copy paste these guys in. Sorry, I got a bit of allergies going on, so maybe a little nasally, or more so than usual. Um, for the three. Now we have a blocker to him folding, so there's, he only folds six cards. Um, then now, but instead of having the deuce, instead of having a blocker to him bluff, we don't have a blocker. So that's the change there. So now we're at, we're indifferent. We're at zero and zero. And now, if you notice, having the three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, they're all the same. Regardless of any of these cards, three through nine, there's going to be six folds. We're never getting value. We're always getting called by three better hands. He's always bluffing, bluff raising once and value raising twice. So these are all going to be the same. We can just copy these on down. And I mean, the reason why these are zeros is because I set it up such that he's playing, he's playing a very balanced strategy. So we're just trying to come up with an optimal strategy against a balanced opponent. Um, and, you know, in this case, he, he's making us indifferent when we have all these three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The reason being because he's folding six times. He's not folding six times. We're laying 10 to win 10. We need to win 50% of the time. And indeed, we are winning 50% of the time. He folds six. He calls six. Because the results of these three, one, two are all the same. All $30. Losing 10. And then we're winning 10 is 50%. So that's why it works out to zero. Now we can move up to 10. Now the difference is when we have a 10, he's we got the full seven folds, three through nine. Um, and we have a blocker, Tim calling with a better hand. 
and this is the same. Um, and the, now the, uh, also the reason why for all of these three through queen when we're outside of his raising range we're going to be indifferent he's giving us two to one and he's got third bluff so like I said before uh, we're indifferent which is why these all work out to be the same and the jack and the king the jack and the queen should as well so when we got the jack now this time we're getting some value when we've got the queen now we got a lot of value and never value cut ourselves except when we get raised Oops. And now with the king, we still got the seven folds, but now we get called by the queen, the jack, and the ten, and we get three wins. And now uh, he bluff raises once, and he value raises once. So now we're no longer indifferent. We're better off calling because we have a blocker to the king. So 50% of the time he bluffs when he raises, 50% of the time he's not bluffing because it's either an ace or it's a deuce. It's nuts or it's air. And now with the ace, the only difference is he always has something worse. And the reason why this is bluff slash worst, uh, bluff slash worse, is because yeah, he's value raising with the king, but we've got the ace. So for all intents and purposes, he's he's bluffing from our perspective. He's he's betting something worse. So that's why it falls into that category. It wouldn't make sense to put it into the value category because we're winning money in this scenario. So, now we can move on to the checks. So we check with the deuce. We know that he's going to he's going to uh, bet with worse never. We've got the not low, so it's impossible. Um, he'll bet he'll bluff with a better hand or bet with a better hand five times, and he will uh, check it down, and we're going to lose seven times: four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, now regarding check raises, uh, when given that he bets. He's going to fold the three, jack and queen. He's going to fold three. We're never going to win, obviously. But he's going to call with the king and the queen. We lose twice. Um, OK, so now the, for the three. Now this time he's going to bet with a deuce, so he does have one worse card. Uh, he's going to uh, bet with the uh, jack, queen, king, ace, four better cards. And when he checks, we're still going to lose all seven. Um, now we still have the three, so um, when we check raise, he's only calling with better. He's folding the, the two jack, queen, calling with the ace and the king, so that stays the same. Hopefully this is not too tedious. Um, if you're following along with me, that should make it a lot more bearable. Um, and I think our results are pretty interesting yeah, in general. And this this will lead into next week's episode, or at least I have that plan now, where we're going to look at uh, a very common spot, which is we call from the blinds. Let's say the cutoff raises. We call with 8-7 suited. The flop is 7-5 deuce. We check call. The turn is say a three we check our opponent checks and then the river is say a deuce so it's seven five deuce three deuce now what is you know what's the play there i mean it's for there it's probably probably uh check fold i guess um but i mean it's going to depend on our opponent's tendencies i mean check fold is a little awkward because really um you know, it's he's probably betting most of his better hands at the turn, so it's kind of unlikely that we're no good. But anyway, it's a very similar situation where we have all of these options: bet, fold, bet, call, check, fold, check, call, check, raise. So based on our opponent's play, I w I w I'm very interested in knowing what you know the best play is there with with um, nines, with say trip deuces, with uh, a, a pocket pair under the under the sevens, like pocket sixes or pocket fours, uh, full house. You know, so we can maybe test what the best line is with um, those different hands and that would be kind of this column here the number of hands and 
or the different hands, and we'll see, you know, what the best line is with each. You know, what what types of hands should we be check raising? What types of hands should we be bluff betting? What types of hands should what what, what should our check call range there be there? Um, if if any. And when we've got the four now, um, when we check raise, we get the full four folds. So check raising is a little bit better than when we have a blocker to his his folding range. So for all three are going to be zero. This is com we're completely indifferent, which is interesting. When you have a four, it does literally does not matter what you do. You could check call and bet call, and it's all the same because our opponent is playing so balanced. And this is kind of like the center of that balanced point where he's balanced from all angles. We're zero EV no matter what. Um, okay, so for a five, now what's going to start changing is these are all the same. The two and the four uh, here. He's going to he's going to always bet the two and the three, the jack queen king ace. So whether we have a four through a ten, it doesn't matter. So that's going to be the same. What's going to change is uh, when he checks whether or not we win or not. So when we have a five, we're going to win once, lose five. When we've got a six, we're going to win two, lose four. So that changes. And then this doesn't change because he's still bet folding the queen, jack, two, three. He's still bet calling the ace and king. So we're just going to keep changing this. So that was one, five. This is two, four. And we can start extrapolating from this point. So if you recall, this times 2 minus the 1 above it. And then these are all the same because he's made us indifferent when we're in this range. Uh, he's bluffing one third of the time, so we're indifferent between check call, check fold, and we're also indifferent between uh, check raising. Check raising has 0 EV, so it's all the same. And if we want to double check, just to make sure that this is correct, we can check with the 10. When we've got the 10, we uh, we always win when he checks it down. So five five five. Now we've got a jack. What changes is now when he checks it down, there's seven folds. But we have a blocker to his bets. He only bets three better hands: the queen, the king, and the ace. He bets the two and the three are worse hands. Um, and now when we decide to check raise, he's only folding. It's actually a bad thing for us because he's now fold. We have a blocker to one of the hands that he's folding. So now he's only folding three, and he's calling with two. So check raising is going to be suboptimal. For a queen, similar, except now um, he's betting with a two, a three, and a jack. That's, those are worse hands, and he's only betting with a better hand twice, king or an ace, and uh, still we're still in that point where where check raising is is no good because uh, he's only folding two out of five. Uh, folding, sorry, three out of five, which is 60%. We need him to fold 67% because we're laying two to win one. Um, for the king, now he's only betting one better hand and four worse hands. When we check raise, he's folding the four worse hands and he's calling with one better hand, the ace. So he's only, you know, we're, we're only, technically we're getting better hands to fold. Uh, technically we're getting all better hands to call the ace and all worse hands to fold. So clearly check raising is not going to be right. As as we determined before, it's, it's no good to be making the play where uh, you're getting all better hands to fold and all worse hands to call. Oh, I always say that backwards. You're getting all better hands to call and all worse hands to fold. Uh, so with the ace, he's only betting worse hands all five, and now the king calls, and the queen jack two three folds. So now we can move on to our table. Now that it's full, we'll do our max. Uh, you know, it max only do, not only works for two selections, works for any number of selections. So we get the the maximum of all these, and we can also come up with you know our overall EV.
is 506. You can bold it. So now we can just type them in. So um, the best line here is bet fold. The best line here is bet and doesn't matter. Here we can either bet and it doesn't matter or we can check and it doesn't matter. Here we can check and it doesn't matter. Here same thing, check doesn't matter and this goes all the way down. Check doesn't matter, check doesn't matter, check doesn't matter, check doesn't matter. Now that we get into his betting range with the jack, it starts to matter. Now there is a clear cut best line and that's check call. So with a queen, clear best line, check call. So it's it's interesting that you know it's two of the only clear lines are to check call with uh, a queen or or jack, and somewhat interesting that the queen it's it's a clear cut and you know by a good margin by uh, two fifty uh, two dollars fifty cents to check call a queen rather than bet it, and it makes some sense because you know we aren't making any money against a raise. We're not betting to induce a raise. We're indifferent against a raise. So we're only getting value from the jack and the 10, and we're sort of losing value against the deuce, the king, and the ace, because the deuce bluffs. Uh, so we are better off check calling where we can uh, get three worse hands to bet and only two better hands to bet, and we don't have to worry about getting raised. Uh, when we've got a king, we can either bet call or we can check call. And it's interesting that they are equal in EV. Um, so when we've got a king, you know, we're not making any money when we get raised. We're getting raised half the time by a worse hand, half the time by a better hand. But we are getting three worse hands to call. When we check with the king, we're getting uh, four worse hands to bet, but we're getting one better hand to bet. So that, you know, the one, these two cancel each other out, the ace and the deuce. You know, for example, because you say you're winning ten here, you're losing. You're winning ten with the ace, you're losing ten with the deuce. So either way, you know, you're getting, you know, three better hands to put in money, sort of, or three worse hands to put in money, I should say. And with the ace, um, bet calling edges out check raising, which is also pretty interesting. And it just sort of, um, it's it sort of has to do with just the way that they, that it's set up. Um, that say when we've got when we decide to bet with an ace, we're inducing, we're getting stacks in against two hands, and we're getting ten bucks from three hands. When we check raise with an ace, we're getting stacks against just the king. So instead of getting stacks against two hands, we're only getting stacks against one hand. Um, but we're getting four hands to put in bets instead of just three. So um, you know, betting to induce the raise does work out to be a little bit better, even though we get money against more hands when we. Uh, when we check call, and that, I think that's something that maybe I fall into the trap of doing is is check raising too much, because I sort of think that check raising is the only way to get stacks in. But in reality, you know, sometimes betting and inducing a raise from someone who's capable of bluff raising is is the best way to, um, or or is a, a more efficient way of getting stacks in. Because, you know, when you do check raise, you're really only getting hit, called by strong hands for the most part. It's it's rare that you're going to get someone to make a hero call against a river check raise, unless you have some good history. So now from here we can develop a strategy. Um, we're gonna have a betting range and a checking range. We're gonna we have so many options here. You know, for example, with uh, with the seven we can just check and it doesn't matter from there. So we'll come up with um, you know try to come up with some sort of balanced strategy. So we know that we should be checking a five, a six, a seven, an eight, a nine. A ten, a jack, and a queen. And we know that we should be betting a deuce, a three, a king, and an ace. And otherwise we have options. So um Actually, oh, I, I, you know what I did wrong? I'm sorry. Uh, the three is, uh, we're different between betting and check folding. So we don't need the three here, actually. So this right here is balanced. We're, bet, we're betting pots, so we want to have one-third bluffs, two-thirds value, if, if, if at all possible. So we can bet the deuce, bet the king and the ace, and now we're balanced. We'll, we'll, and let's see if we can check everything else and if that'll work out. Actually, 
this over too. Um, so when we check the three, uh, we can let's see we can fold. When we check the four, it doesn't matter. Up through the queen and the jack, where we should be calling. And now our goal here is to call with half of our range to make him indifferent. So when we when we bet, we have one third bluffs. When we call, we're calling half the time because he's laying one. He's laying ten to win ten, so we want to call half the time. And it does work out that we can do that. So we're going to call half the time up through an eight. We're going to fold half the time down through a seven. These all fit in with our optimal strategy. Um, so with the deuce, obviously, we want to fold. With the king, we can bet call, and with an ace, we can get we can bet call. And actually. Um, our we're calling two thirds of the time, so it's it's not profitable for him to be bluffing. We're not uh, for him to be bluff raising. So, uh, in, in that respect, we are not balanced because really his adjustment to our range here will be to not uh, to not bluff raise ever. Um, but if we do check, uh, he is indifferent whether or not he should be bluffing or calling. You know, depending on what card he has. So this would be our range. We can color code it. You know, sort of different things, but here we're gonna, uh, you know, we're gonna our our entire range will be check folding the three through the seven, check calling the eight through the queen, betting the ace, the king, and the deuce, and that's our optimal strategy. And it'll net an EV of five dollars per per hand. Um, and now this is sort of a lead in or sort of kind of um, merges with that quiz question that I asked you because if you look at it it's basically the exact same situation but from our opponent's perspective and um, you'll come up and I'll show you my results next time and it'll it'll it, it'll come together nicely with with our strategy here which we've developed um, which kind of as a spoiler it's going to minimize our opponent's EV by maximizing our EV we're minimizing our opponent's EV so uh, that will conclude this particular exercise. Now, as promised, uh, I'm going to show you some Excel uh, functions at the end. And for those of you who understand about locking cells and if statements, uh, you don't have to, or, and there's not, there's not much value for you watching that. But for those of you who don't, um, these are really, really useful uh, tools in Excel. Uh, so let's start off with an if statement. And the way an if statement works is if something is true, if some logical statement, logical meaning if, say, this equals 2, then we want it to write the word 2 in quotes. If you want to do text, it's in quotes. If you want to do numbers, let's say you want to otherwise do the, end, the number 0, then you don't need quotes. So if it's equal to number two, we'll write two. Otherwise, it'll leave a zero. So we know this is a two, and the rest should be a zero if this worked. OK, so it worked. If you ever um, you know, want to see what the equation is, it's, it's up here if, if I do it too quickly, which I hope I won't. So next, if, let's say we want to say, if this is greater than one, we'll call, or if this is greater than zero, we'll call it a winner. So if it was negative, it'll be a loser. So hopefully this is pretty straightforward by now, uh, now that we've done you know, now this is two. So if this is greater than zero, it'll be a winner. Otherwise, it'll be a loser. These are all winners, as we already should have you know, known by looking at it. But you'll see why it becomes useful. Let's say. All right, well, we know that if it's greater than zero, it's a winner. Now, let's say if it's greater than two, we'll call it a big winner. If it's greater than zero, we'll call it a winner. So what we can do is embed, a st embed an if statement. So if this is true, then we'll spit out this. If, let's say if this, is, if this is greater than two, it's a big winner. Otherwise, if it's greater than zero, it's still a winner. So we, we'd have to in embed an if statement. So, if this is greater than 2,
we'll call it a big winner. Otherwise, if this is greater than zero, it's still a winner. And otherwise, it's a loser. So if this worked, these will be big winner on down here. So there we go. Now finally, let's go for what we're really going for, and that's to tell us whether it's bet, check, or neutral. So, if, if the EV of betting is greater than the EV of checking, clearly we want to bet. If the EV of checking is greater than the EV of betting, clearly we want to check. And we have two options. We could either just do otherwise it's neutral, that's fine. But let's say we want to we want to test it just to make sure because there could be an error of some sort. So if they're equal, if one equals the other, then it's neutral. And if I mean it, Obviously, this should be impossible at this point, uh, this, this else, because either one's greater than the other or they're equal. But if that's the case, then we'll call that an error. Then we have to close our parentheses. We close the first one, close the second one, close the third one. So uh, for this particular table, I don't remember specifically which one it was. I just kind of found one and copied it. Um, it's telling us we should bet if bet in these situations where it's the EV of betting is greater, here it's telling us it's neutral, and here it's telling us the EV of betting is greater than the EV of checking. Now, um, so that's, I mean, that's the if statement. Hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can, you know, you could try to work on some of these on your own to get used to them. I mean, the biggest issues I have with them sometimes are when they, when too, I embed too many of them, or sometimes I get the syntax wrong. Um, so, I mean, they're, yeah, they're pretty straightforward. Extremely, 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 extremely useful. I use them all the time. Um, but now let's move on to locking cells. And this is something that's really useful and that I've done here already. So if you see these dollar signs, um, that's what it basically is. So now let's say for these numbers here, back at our table we just worked on, I want to just simply divide five divided by 12. So 5 of the 12 cards, it gives us 41.67%. But now the problem is if we drag this down, this formula down, we're getting problems because it's not only dragging this down, but it's dragging this red one down with it. We simply want each one, we want this 12 to be locked. We want to know 5 divided by 12, 0 divided by 12, 7 divided by 12. So we want these to move down, but we want this to stay the same. And what you do is, in Excel, you can do F4. I don't know why it doesn't work in this one. And I don't know if there is a button. If someone if someone knows, I would love for you to tell me. But what you do is you put in dollar signs. Dollar signs lock the cell. So when we drag it down, this, G19, this G19 is free. So when we drag it down, it'll go G20, G21, G22. However, the G17 will stay. So there we go. As you can see, they all stayed the same. Now, what you can also do is only use one dollar sign. The one dollar sign locks it in one direction, but not the other. So in this direction, we want it to stay at 17, but we, since we're dragging it down, we don't necessarily care about the column. So we can only use the dollar sign for 17 if we'd like. And as you can see, it still, it still locks it in. Now, if we were to drag it sideways, as you could hopefully, uh, you know, surmise or figure out that uh, it would slide this red one over to the right. So, you know, I'll show you that. And there you go. See, it's, it slid the right, the red one over to the right. It also slid the blue one over to the right. However, now if we were to drag this down, this would still stay locked into the 17 because it's locked into row 17, but not into the column. And you could do it, you know, the opposite way as well. So those were a couple of uh, Excel, you know, open office tricks, and I'm going to try to, you know, conclude most of these videos with some with some tricks to, uh, you know, 
slowly help you add to your repertoire of uh, Excel functions because there are endless numbers of them and uh, I, I'm sure uh, you know I've, I've been using these this for probably 10 years and I'm still only scratching the surface of all that's possible so um, that will conclude this video and thanks everyone for watching I really you know it was maybe a bit tedious at times but I really hope that you followed along with me and I hope that you learned a bit more about how ranges work uh, what it means to be balanced what it means to put your opponent in a situation where he's indifferent when you want to be balanced, when you don't want to be balanced. I mean, I, I learned a lot from this, and I just, I feel like as long as I keep learning from these videos, hopefully, you know, you all are learning as well. So uh, this has been Josh for Juices Cracked, and thanks again for watching.